Hello, hello. Welcome back to class. How's everyone doing? I've got some kitties looking at me through the door. Maybe I'll, I'll, go, I'll start the class with some kitties. Hang on one second. Here we go. This is Freckles. Say hello, Freckles. <laughs> okay, he wants to go outside. Give me one second. So kittens only, cats only want you for one reason, and that's to get outside, apparently. So, all right, back to class. Um, so just a quick overview of where we are again. Um, today is November the 5th, and today we're going to be talking about game tools and dragging and dropping. So that's going to be something that's going to be important for the project. Uh, so, oh, also... In five days on Tuesday, assignment three is due, and we'll talking about uh, assignment four. So assignment four is the last assignment in the course, and then after assignment four, you'll pretty much just be working on the project for the rest of the course. So, um, give me one second here. I think my microphone volume was a little bit low. How's the volume out there? Can anyone tell me? All right, so let's get into the game tools and drag and drop stuff. Here we go. So let me set up the PowerPoint. PowerPoint F5, here we go. All right, this is pretty cool stuff. I, I like this stuff uh, in particular because without tools, um, you can't really do anything, right? So. Okie doke. Game tools. So what you're going to find as you get better and better at programming games and as you make more games and your skill, you know, your, your skill just increases in general at game design and making games. What you're going to learn very quickly is that content creation becomes the most time consuming aspect of video game development. And so content creation being, for example, making levels developing assets, um, this sort of thing. So tools are programs that assist us with creating content for our games. Um, and many tools exist to help with general asset creation. So for example, you have things like Blender for uh, 3D development. You have Photoshop for 2D artwork and textures. You have pixel art, uh, Notepad even, for example. <laughs> Just, um, but for more specific asset creation, maps or levels, we need to construct our own tools and able to help us. I have another cat banging at the door. Just give me one second. Oh, okay, okay. She wants to be on camera for a second. This is Luna. Sorry to interrupt the lecture. Not much I can do with her banging at the door. <laughs> Say hello, Luna. Say hello. There you go. Okay. So now ba back to the PowerPoint. So yeah, for, for more specific asset creation, so for example, game maps or levels, uh, we need to construct our own tools um, in order to be able to help us, right? Because we can't use Photoshop to create levels for our game, for example. First, let's talk about more general game design tools um, and game creation tools, which are sort of these popular game engines that exist. So several popular game engines already exist 
that come with tools for creating content. So for example, we have Unity, we have Unreal. These are the more popular um, 3D game engines. We have things like Godot or Godot, uh, some people might say, um, uh, Game Maker, etc. So these are game engines that are sort of more general and allow you to make sort of any sort of game within those uh, programs. They can also help you with the programming. Uh, I know that like Unreal, for example, has blueprints which help you to, to do logic in the game and sort of visual programming stuff. Um, and they do a great job of illustrating the power of tools for game creation. So just how, how well creating good tools can help speed up the game design and game creation process. So here for an example, um, I believe this is Unity. Um, and in here, it just shows one of the, the level creation tools within Unity. And so here we can see that we're creating uh, a map for a specific game in this sort of like 2.5D uh, space where you have the, this voxel based game. Um, also, you can edit worlds completely in 3D uh, in these engines. So here's an example of how easy it is to just uh, draw a path in the game. So over here on the right side of the map, you're, uh, there's this thing called texture painting. And so this is an older version of Unity, but you can select a texture. And when you have the texture, it's going to paint that texture onto your surface and also depress it a little bit, right? So you have all of these tools available. Um, for example, if we wanted to add a hill of grass, well, instead of depressing the ground, we would raise the ground up. And we can get something like this. Um, where the ground is being raised and we can make hills, we can put in uh, rocks, grass, trees, textures, all sorts of things with these game engines in order to help us content create. So you can just imagine how difficult this would be without these sorts of tools, right? If we had to sort of specify each ver vertex and each surface in the level, it, it would just be crazy. And so what they do is they release these game engines which, which give you tools which for the most part, for 99% of games, will be able to help you create that game. Here's another example where someone has drawn a, a road within a map and you can actually just drag that road around. So if you don't want to have to say delete the road and then completely remake it, you can select certain points along that road and the road is defined by a curve and then dragging those points on the road is just editing the parameters of the curve. And you can see here that like um, there's some default stuff already in the level. So for example, this tree is here, but when you drag the road over the tree, it knows to, for example, get rid of the tree at that spot in the road. Also, as I said before, um, this is an example from Godot, I believe, and it's um, sort of their blueprint maker where you can specify input variables and then you have these um, these squares in the middle in which they have inputs and outputs and you can say modify the variables that were input and then go out through the outputs and you don't have to write a single line of code. And so this is a case where this sort of visual programming is happening and it can help uh, game designers change the code without actually editing lines of code. Someone is trying to eat my foot. That is Luna. Okay. So custom game tools. If your game is not using a pre-existing engine, then you must create your own tools. So for example, in this game, we're writing our game engine from scratch, right? We're, we're not using a, we're not using Unreal or Unity like some, some noob. We're actually making our own game engine. And so if we want to have, if we want to have tools, then we have to create them ourselves. And so many existing games, especially older games, come with editors and tools for modding or creating custom content. And so the features and the power of these tools vary really wildly from game to game, but I just wanted to go over a few of them right now that I've used over the years um, that have really made a difference in terms of like sort of the history of, of game design. And it's crazy how these tools actually helped create entire genres of games um, just by the tools themselves existing. So things that, uh, anyway, I'll get into that in, in a couple of slides. 
Here, for example, is a screenshot of the Warcraft 2 map editor. So who out there in the chat is actually old enough to remember Warcraft 2? Did you actually play Warcraft 2? So you can see here, this was 1995, um, this version of Warcraft 2. So, so who was around back then? I know not... <laughs> probably most people in the class weren't even born then. Okay. So in this map editor, it was really incredible. It was so much better than any other map editor I'd ever seen up to that point. So here we see this is a Windows application, probably Windows 95 or... Um, yeah, probably Windows 95. So up here we have a menu. Here we can do things like we can paint um, the screen. So we can, we can take the map and we can say paint in more water, right? So up here I would just click on water and then I would start drawing on the map. I could bring down say tools and insert units. For example here, I could edit the amount of gold in a gold mine. Uh, I can do anything to this map within Warcraft 2 from this level editor. And actually all of the levels that were created for the campaign of the game were created within this level editor. So this was really revolutionary. And, and Blizzard, it's a shame what happened to Blizzard over the years, but Blizzard used to be absolutely amazing. Like they would give you the tools that they use to create the content for the game. And so people created all sorts of really, really cool stuff um, with this level editor and it was absolutely amazing. And it turned out that players knew a lot more about map creation than the designers did. And the maps that ended up being used in tournaments and stuff weren't necessarily the ones that were released with the game, but ones that players had created and played over the years. Okay. This was called Doom Builder. And so Doom was a very popular first-person shooter game. Let me know if you, you actually played Doom like back on a, a pre-Pentium machine. I remember that uh, I played Doom on my first ever PC. My PC had two megabytes of RAM. Two megabytes, not gigabytes. Two megabytes of RAM. And the thing was, if I launched Windows, so Windows 3.1, technically I could run Doom through Windows, but my computer didn't have enough RAM to run both. So what I would have to do is like press F8 to start my computer in DOS mode to run Doom. That's how little RAM I had. But anyway, I was able to run Doom. So here we see a tool that was actually created by players to edit the Doom WAD files. So these WAD files were um, sort of like the zip files of Doom that created a bunch of different files. Sorry, that stored a bunch of different files like textures and maps and stuff. So you could load a WAD file and you could edit the files within that file and I'll also edit the level. And um, I think they're called BSP files or something like that. I can't exactly remember. But here, for example, you could change the level geometry. Uh, you could make stairs. You could edit things in three dimensions. It was excellent. Then you got to Quake. And Quake also had some level editors for it. And I remember very, very fondly uh, making my own Quake levels. I wasn't very good at it. But you could do every, everything that you could do in a level, you could do through these level editors. So for example, you could make your own 3D space and then carve out areas. Uh, you could put uh, enemies in the game. You could edit the properties of weapons like how far uh, or how fast a rocket would fire or how much ammo your gun had or the gravity of the level. Um, it was really cool to be able to do that because up until this point, these tools really didn't exist. Um, like there was basic tools like Warcraft 2 level editor, but these 3D tools that people made for editing uh, Quake levels and stuff were just absolutely incredible. Now, we move along to Warcraft 3. So the Warcraft 3 editor was at a whole nother level, okay? You could write in a scripting language inside the Warcraft 3 level editor. So you could do like things like custom triggers, like if you walk over this part of the map, then something will spawn and it will have these properties and it will go here. And then if this happens, this will happen. Or if that doesn't happen, then 17 enemies will pop up and slowly start moving to the bottom of the screen, right? So someone in the, in the chat there is, is way ahead of me already. 
And if you weren't aware, so Dota 2 is one of the most popular games in the world right now and has been for a few years. The original Dota, so Defense of the Ancients, was actually a player-created Warcraft 3 map. So someone took the level editor from Warcraft 3, which was intended to basically just create these little tiny arcade games, and actually created a, an en entirely new genre of games, which is the multiplayer online battle arena, or MOBA. Okay, technically that's not true. The first MOBA game was actually a, a StarCraft map mod called Aeon of Strife. So Aeon of Strife technically was the first MOBA, but um, Dota built inspiration on Aeon of Strife. The, 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 the creators of the original Dota map said that, yeah, we looked at Aeon of Strife and we just made it a lot better. And we were able to do that because of the Warcraft 3 editor. So Dota wasn't the first, but it was the first popular uh, MOBA game. And that like spawned an entire industry, like League of Legends. Anyone ever heard of that? That only exists because of Dota, because some guy or girl, I'm not sure, took, took the Warcraft 3 editor, which was intended to make Warcraft maps and made an entirely new genre of game. Just think about that. Like, what games out there right now are releasing editors for their games? Just think about what you could do with that. But... Anyway, I guess developers used to really care about content creation. Then, the StarCraft 2 map... Uh, StarCraft 2 came out. I know that I'm, like, sort of sticking with Blizzard here, but it's for a good reason. And the reason is that um, they released really excellent editors for their games. Uh, so StarCraft 2 went even a step further. Like, it's absolutely nuts. It's, StarCraft 2 level editor is almost like Unity. It's, it's absolutely insane. Like, people have created... Uh, someone created Diablo within StarCraft 2. Someone created, like, World of StarCraft, which was an MMO that you could group with and do dungeons and stuff, and it was like a 3D game within the StarCraft 2 editor. Absolutely crazy what you were able to do with this. Um, if you've never used it, I, I recommend trying it sometime. Also, who's played this game? Right, so now we've got the, uh, since uh, Super Mario Maker came out, we've got uh, a, a whole new genre of, of type of games where people are making their levels, they're releasing them online, people are playing them. There's lots of really great YouTube content and Twitch content based around this. And so what Nintendo did a couple of years back was say, okay, let's let, let people make their own Mario games. And the way that they did the level editor was was really incredible. Um, the intuitive drag and drop interface, you could set triggers, um, you could, like the visual programming that you could do from within the Mario Maker editor, if you've never tried it, I, I really recommend it. Here's another thing. Um, this is called Speed Tree. And Speed Tree is one of my favorite pieces of software ever. Not because it was like, necessarily the best piece of software but it's because someone took an idea and did it so well that they made a whole company around it and what speed tree is is they literally make trees and so what this <laughs> you're like what do you mean Dave what do you mean make trees well the software has a bunch of algorithms in it for creating realistic and customizable trees not like Get, like programming trees, but physical trees, right? Well, virtual physical trees. So here's an example where they say they have a slider here where you could say change from summer to fall to winter. And so if your game has has like a, I don't know, a season cycle, your trees could be changing automatically. You can press a button in Speed Tree and you can say, okay, here's the type of tree that I want and it will populate an entire forest for you. Right? So Speed Tree has plugins into Unity, it has plugins into UE4, and so if you want like a really big forest with all these cool customizable trees with different properties of the leaves and stuff like that, and all the collision boxes already done for you, then you can just use Speed Tree. 
And it's crazy. Like, imagine saying, I'm going to make trees for video games and, and having a really successful company based around that. I, I love it. This is really, really cool. Okay. So, now that we've shown some examples of, of tools, how would we go and implement these tools? So, game tools are typically made along with a graphical user interface, or GUI, which includes some sort of menu system, right? So if we look back here, we can see, like, essentially, what we have is some window to look at the thing that we're editing, and that might be half the screen or a little bit less, and then the rest of the screen is user interface, right? Because when you're editing using tools, you want as much control as possible. And in order to have that control, you want to have these controls on the screen. So essentially, you know, you're going to end up looking like something like Photoshop in the end, where you have like the image that you're editing and a bunch of controls all over the place. So in this course, we won't be implementing our own fully functional user interface, but we can still implement some tool-like interfaces, okay? And so the first step to implementing that is, is drag and drop, okay? So what we can do with drag and drop is, is incredible. We can do really, really cool things in our games. So let me just show you really quick. Uh, over here, so this is a, a beefed up version of assignment three that I use for some of my research, okay? And what you're about to see on the next few slides allows you to implement drag and drop in your game live while you're playing it, okay? So, I can click and drag around the entities in the game while I'm playing, like this. Not only that, but um, if I am on this block and I'm dragging it, all the physics interact with the game level, right? And I can do things, it's a little bit hard to control, but I can do things like this. And I don't know if you've seen a game do this before, but this is like 20 lines of code, if that, to add this to your game engine, okay? So if you're thinking of a bonus feature, maybe you could do something like this. Not only that, but let's say that this level was like this, and now I have this sort of puzzle in the level. Well, the puzzle now involves editing the level to solve the level, right? So that's really cool. So the next few slides, you'll be able to add into your code really easily. Oh, there we go. I died. All right. Okay. So the first step is going to be drag and drop. And what I mean by drag and drop is the ability to click something, drag it, and then drop it somewhere. Okay. So, drag and drop. Drag and drop typically refers to the ability to move an on-screen UI element from one place to another with the mouse. And so, in order to implement a basic level editing tool for our games, we can implement drag and drop via ECS. So, just like anything, if we want to add a new feature to our game, what we're first going to do is create a draggable component. Right? And then an entity is going to be able to have a draggable component. So there's some drag and drop variants, and they all mean the same thing, but they're implemented in slightly different ways. So if you talk about like literally dragging and dropping like Windows or Mac do, then what's going to happen is when you, when you detect the mouse was clicked, so mouse down, mouse button down on an entity, then you're going to start the dragon. As the mouse moves, you're moving the entity, and when you release, you let go of the entity, okay? That is fine, but it's actually a little bit annoying to implement in practice. So what we're going to do, instead of pure drag and drop, we're going to implement pick up and put down. So when you click on an entity, you're going to pick it up. As your mouse moves, the entity is going to follow the mouse cursor, and then you're going to click the final location to put it there. So if I go back to the game that I was showing before, this is what's happening. So I click on the Goomba, right? I click on the Goomba, and now I click it again to place it there. Let me just quickly not die here. So I click once 
on this thing. And so you can see that I'm not dragging it, right? My mouse isn't down. And then I click to put it down somewhere else, okay? And so we can do all sorts of things. We can expose this guy here. We can put this one up here. And so that's what we're going to be doing with the drag and drop. Okay. So the draggable component is really, really simple. It's just got a Boolean in it, which says whether or not the entity is currently being dragged. So we've got this draggable component. Now, I can envision things that you'd want to do, like maybe you would want to add variables to this. Like for example, where the entity started before it was dragged, in, in case you wanna like cancel the operation or something like that. But in its basic form, all the draggable component is, is hey, is this thing currently being dragged, right? So let's look at how we would do this. So now somewhere in our input system, so remember, we've changed from the input system to an action-based system. So this is sort of an abstract view of it. So you wouldn't necessarily do it exactly like this. You would have an action for clicking with the mouse instead of an input. But intuitively or abstractly, we can just say if the left mouse button was clicked or pressed, we're going to have a function which is closest draggable entity to mouse click position, right? So let's say we just have a function which takes the mouse position, loops over all of our entities, and it returns the entity that we clicked, okay? So if we clicked an entity, then we get an entity. Otherwise, we get this null or something like that. So that's what this function does. Um, and of course, we would consider clicking an entity if we clicked somewhere within that entity, right? So I, I mouse click right here, and then I'm, I'm currently dragging the entity. So the next line of code, we have, um, we wanna get the component. So we get the draggable component of the entity, right? So we're not doing error handling here. We're assuming that everything has a draggable component, but of course, we would detect, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. My apologies. This is the closeable, closest draggable entity, okay? So here, we get the draggable components, dragging Boolean, and we just have a reference to that, okay? So that's D, whether or not it's currently being dragged. So if D is equal to true, then that means the current entity is being dragged already, right? So we're gonna set D equal to false. So that means, here, I'm gonna go back, uh, discard this. So as I, right now, every entity on the screen is draggable. They're dragging, their draggable components dragging Boolean are all false, okay? When I click on an entity, the dragging Boolean of this entity is now equal to true. So if the dragging components, sorry, if the draggable components boolean is true, then when I click the left mouse button, I just want to set dragging to false. That's all I have to do, okay? So now that I've set dragging to false, it's no longer following the mouse cursor. So that's what this line of code does right here. It says that we get the entity that's currently closest to the mouse position. We get its dragging Boolean. If that dragging Boolean is true, then we set it to false. Okay. Otherwise, if dragging is false, if the mouse click was inside the entity's animation, then dragging is true. Okay. So that essentially just means that we now have to check if it was false, so if the closest thing to the mouse position, if it wasn't being dragged, then we're going to detect whether or not we clicked inside it and start dragging it. And the starting of the dragging is just setting this Boolean to true. And the stopping of the dragging is just setting this Boolean to false. It couldn't be simpler, right? You're just setting a Boolean variable. And that's how we start and stop the dragging event then we're going to have a draggable or drag and drop system, okay? So that's gonna be this system right here, and it's just going to say for every entity, 
in our game, if it has a draggable component and it's being dragged, set its position to the current mouse position. That's it. So simple. It couldn't be simpler, right? So for everything that's being dragged, set its position to the current mouse position. Done. Crazy how simple that is. So that's, that's a drag and drop system right there. So if you are working on your level editor for the project, this is one way that you can do that, is you can set up an entity which just has the animation that you want, and you can set its draggable component, and then you're dragging it around the map and you're setting it somewhere. Or if you want to have a live editable version of your game, which I just showed, which is a bit overkill, you don't necessarily need that, then you can, excuse me, you can do that as well. And one of the really cool things that you could do with this game is, for example, let's say by default, and just, just imagine trying to do this without ECS, okay? Just imagine trying to do this without, without ECS. So let's say, instead of whenever, so right now, whenever I shoot a brick, it dies, okay? So let's say by default, um, I'm, I couldn't drag around these question marks. Right? So they're not draggable. What I could do is have like a draggable gun that whenever a draggable bullet hits an entity, now I can drag it around. And when I shoot it again, I can't drag it. So think about all the cool gameplay mechanics that you can have with that. Like, you could create a level, like I said before, where maybe I have to, for example, let's move this cloud over. Maybe I have to get up to this question mark right? And so I can't get up there right now. But what might be able to happen is if I have my like my my draggable gun or whatever I want to call it, I could shoot this block. And whenever I shoot a block with that gun, then it could add a draggable component to that block. Now I can drag the block up here. And now I can get to this part. Like, have you ever seen a game with that mechanic? You think all game mechanics are done, right? But I've never seen a game do that before. And it's so interesting, right? So it's just cool how you can, with ECS, in for free almost, you can get this behavior. And and how in the name, like, how, how would you possibly do that without ECS? It would be so convoluted. You'd have millions of lines of code. But... Here, instead of like, like I said, instead of destroying the brick, you just add a draggable component. And you've got this really cool game mechanic done for you. Okay. Now, so that's drag and drop. We're not going to go into any like menuing stuff just yet. Um, because that's, that's a bit over the scope of the course. I want it to be about game programming. But drag and drop is something that's really easy to implement. And it can create a lot of fun game mechanics. Now let's talk about game progression and game saving, because you have to do this for your project as well. So a vital part of any game is the ability to save the player's progress at some point. Uh, games can be saved in a number of different ways. Like there's, there's infinite possible ways that you could save a game. Save games can be stored in a number of ways as well. So for example, you could have a local file, you could have a cloud save, you could have a temporary quick save in RAM, you could have a password, etc. I remember, so who remembers memory cards? T type in the chat if you've ever played a video game system that used a memory card. <laughs> so which, which systems did you use that used a memory card? My first was uh, PS1. So for the PlayStation 1, I remember that... Uh, so my mom bought me my PS1. I think I was in grade 7. Grade 7 or 8. So I got a PlayStation 1 for Christmas. I got the game that I asked for. I got Wild Arms. Wild Arms is an excellent RPG. If you've never played Wild Arms, I highly recommend it. But here's what happened. <laughs> My mom said, no, I didn't, uh, I, I said, where's the memory card? Because this was Christmas, right? Or my birthday or something. And she's like, what memory card? She had no idea what a memory card was. And when I told her that it was $40, she's 
She's like, you're not getting a memory card. You don't need that. You can play the game. <laughs> oh, God. So what I had to do was I had to just stop playing. And, like, I put the PlayStation under my bed so that I wouldn't accidentally turn it off. And I did that for, like, a week and a half until I finally saved up enough money to go out to microplay video games does anyone does anyone remember microplay video games what is it called now it's it's like x games or something right next to mana bakery and i finally got enough money to buy a ps1 memory card games exchange yeah it used to be called microplay video games and uh after a week and a half i finally got a memory card and i put it in and when i put it in the game crashed It crashed because I put the memory card in during the game. I was so mad. <sighs> and this, that also, I, I got to tell you another story. I know this is a bit of a tangent. But because of this me putting my PlayStation under my bed so that no one would turn it off. I PlayStation 1, by the way. There was, the, <laughs> there was a rumble controller for it. And I think it was PS1, or was it, am I confusing this with PS2? Was there a rumble controller for PS1? I think there was. And while it was like under my bed, I thought there was a mouse under my bed because something was like happening in the game that every like few minutes, something would walk by and make the controller vibrate. And the controller was under my bed and I thought there was like a mouse under my bed. Anyway, that's just a funny, a funny story. I was, I swore that there was a mouse under my bed because when I would look, this event wasn't happening. And then like five minutes later, when I wasn't looking, I would hear the sound. Anyway, fun, fun times, old video games. Okay. So this is all about game saving, believe it or not. Um, but just to tell you that, and I still have somewhere my PS1 memory card with my Final Fantasy VII save game on it with like 99 hours on it. Okay. Oh, that's weird. Look at this. Okay, so games can be saved in a number of ways. So we have file save, quick save, checkpoint, and they can be saved in a number of places. So, saving games. When you allow players to save their progress um, is a game design decision, right? So, for example, if you allow players to save and load whenever they like, this can lead to much easier gameplay. So who ever played like Half-Life 1 or Half-Life 2 and just had your finger always on the quick save and quick load buttons. It was like, take five steps forward, quick save. That, that was me. Like, sometimes I would even like, if I used a rocket and didn't hit something, to save ammo, I'd quick load, right? <laughs> Some people are saying, I don't quick save, I have skill. Skyrim, oh yeah, Skyrim. But who out there in Skyrim like accidentally quick saved right before like an axe hit you, right? So you quick save and then you die a half a second later and then you're screwed because you're in an infinite loop of death. I've done that before. Oh man, I was... Ugh. So I had to like, then you got to load like the default save, which was the last, I don't know, boss you killed or something like that and lose like five hours of gameplay. Fun stuff. Uh, someone asked, what about passwords? We'll get to passwords. Oh, don't worry. We'll get to passwords. Oh, yeah, falling off a mountain, too. Quick save. So when you fall, you need to hit click lo quick load, but then you uh, you hit quick, lo quick save instead. Someone says, the quick save function is so broken in old source games, the speed run skips. Oh, yeah. So, for example, uh, I've watched those, too, the Half-Life speed runs where you can quick save and, like, when you quick when you load after a quick save, you're, like, two pixels higher than where you were, so you can use quick save and quick load to, like, go out of bounds and stuff. Okay. Um, someone said passwords aren't really saving, though. Oh, yes, they are. They are. They save data, so they save progress, and we'll talk about that. Um, saving after or mid-level, so you could have checkpoints, right? So if you don't want people to be able to save all the time, maybe you want people to be able to save like halfway through a level. So for example, Super Mario World for the SNES has the most canonical example of this where you go through a little um, flag or what do you call it, a gate, um, and, and that's a checkpoint. So then when you die, if you die, you'll go back to that place. Also, um, 
you could have saving only at very specific locations. So for example, maybe only saving in a town or in the world map or at a save point. And, and the thing is, that can be really inconvenient for a player, but it's convenient for the game designer because you get to say when they can save. So who out there has ever been playing like an old JRPG like Final Fantasy VI or something like that and you know there's about to be a boss fight because you you go into like a cave and the only thing in a, in the cave is an exit at the top of the screen and a save point, right? So you know shit's about to go down when there's a cave with a save point in it. All right. And who else out there would never use tents. I would I would never use my tents. I'm like, I have 99 tents in my inventory, but just in case I need to use 99 tents in the future, I'm not going to use a tent right now. Like, it's such a waste. I don't know. It's like you always save that super elixir for the boss fight that never comes. Um, but anyway, that's that's another tangent. Okay. Saving between levels. So the easiest way to implement a game save is between levels, when there are no active entities in the game world, right? So for example, um, in very simple games, uh, without quests, without inventories, without status, etc., we can just save the level number. So if we're on level 17, we can somehow save, okay, the player's on level 17. There's no inventory, there's no status, there's no items, whatever. Just say, this player's on level 17. Whether or not you write that to a memory card or a file or a quick save or quick load or whatever um, or in RAM that you just save the level number and that's all we would need to do. Uh, so, so those are the different ways of saving, right? There's quick save and quick load, saving after a checkpoint, saving at specific locations, and also saving between levels. So that's that's sort of... I can't think of any other ways to save the game. If anyone else can, um, there's like auto save, I guess, where you could auto save after you kill a boss or something like that. That's another way. Okay. So someone asked, is that all we need to do for the project? So the project specification says exactly what you need to do for the project. So go read that if possible. Displaying progress. So users progress must be conveyed somehow so that their progress can continue. Right? So for example, um, the simplest possible ways is just to display the level number. So for example here, over on the left we have Donkey Kong. Um, and so in Donkey Kong, you get like uh, your level number over here. Uh, you get the number of lives you have left. You have a score. Um, over here for Super Mario World, you have World 3-1. So in Super Mario, there's eight worlds with four levels each. And so you go up one, two, three, four until you get to the next world. And then in eight, four, you beat it and you save the princess. So you have to display the progress somehow. And the simplest possible way to display progress is if you only care about the levels. So this is one way to do that. Another common way to display level progress is an overworld map. And the overworld map displays a deeper sense of immersion or progress because what you can do with an overworld map is instead of just saying, okay, my integer has increased by one, you get kind of this sense of adventure like you're moving through a world, right? So this is Donkey Kong Country over here. It's overworld map. There were actually two tiers to the overworld map. There, was, there were worlds in the game. And then there were, so there was an overworld map to select the world, which I don't have um, shown. Um, but then within each world, there was also an overworld map. And so here, for example, you're at like Funky's Flights and you can move. If you hit the right button, you move to this level. Uh, if you hit the right button from here, you move to this level. Over here, we see the Super Mario World for the Super Nintendo. We see the over, like the over overworld map. This view actually was not in the game. This is like a user created art. But when you go through um, each of these worlds, you have a uh, an overworld map then that we can use to actually go through and select the levels. So here's another example of a really beautiful overworld map, and this is uh, in Cuphead. So if you haven't played Cuphead, I highly recommend it. Just the best art in any 2D game ever. Really, really incredible. Hand-drawn frames of animation in, in Cuphead. Really, really cool. Um, also, not only the levels, but if you have things like leveling up 
or achievements, etc., you can display this progress as well. And so, for example, in Cuphead, you can get new weapons, you can upgrade weapons, some weapons are locked, and so we can display the progress somehow like this. So in Cuphead, you have, you're actually walking through the map to go from level to level, and you're also, uh, in the overworld, you can look at the progress of all your different weapons as well. Okay, so in your game, for the project, excuse me, um, you do need to have some sort of overworld map in which you are controlling an entity to walk around to, to select the levels, okay? So whether they're on rails like this, and by on rails I mean like you hit left or right and you automatically go to the next level, or it's like Cuphead where you're actually traversing around a map um, freely to select a level, that's up to you. It may actually be easier to implement the free-flowing thing than the on rails thing, believe it or not. Who knows what this is? <laughs> so, you can also display your progress in the most convoluted way possible, right? And so if you're looking at this and you're saying, oh my god, what the hell is this? It would take me about an hour to explain the Path of Exile mapping system. And how the progression works and how the... Oh my god, you, you don't even want to know. But this is the progression for the end game of Path of Exile maps where you you use these map f these map runes and you complete a map and then you get another map rune and you complete that map and you complete these chains and not only chains but you can put modifiers in here to give bonus things to maps around within that region and then you complete all the things of a certain level in order to unlock specific ones and when you get like all four of the the special ones done then you can go to the end well, it's it's insane, okay, and I'm not even going to get into the skill tree. Some people are talking about the skill tree in Path of Exile. The skill tree is very easy to understand. There's just a lot of things, right? So the skill tree is dead simple. There might be 1,200 different points, right? But all the complexity of the skill tree is how you allocate them in what order, it's very simple to understand a skill tree in Path of Exile. There's just a lot of stuff. But understanding the rules of this mapping system is insane. Just go watch a YouTube video about it. They're like 45 minutes long. It's, it's crazy. I, I still don't fully understand and I played it for a long, long time. Here's another type of progress where you might have a game like uh, Heroes of the Swarm. I think this is it. Yeah, this is this is Hots. So here you've got different um, you've got different characters, and you might say, okay, you played this character for a while. They get some experience, and then um, after you get a certain amount of experience, maybe you get some new talents, maybe you get some gold or a skin or a loot box or whatever, right? So this is also a form of progression in your game. So your project is going to show your progression somehow, but I've chosen. Okay, you're going to have to have some sort of overworld map that you traverse, just because it'll sort of standardize the games. Okay. Um, talking about progress and saving, if you have an RPG game, you may have what's called a save point. Save points. Okay. So save points make it easier to implement game saving and loading by limiting the places where players can save and load. So Something you may not have thought about up until I'm about to explain it is why the programmer wanted to put the save points where they did. So there's one thing about save points which is like, in terms of the progression of the game, why the game designer might want to have it there. So for example, you might want to have a save point right before a boss because you want the player, you want to give them that hint that okay, there's a boss coming up, right? You need to um, you need to stock up on MP, you need to heal your hit points, etc. You need to get your items ready. So that's a game design decision. But from a game implementation point of view, you may not have thought about that until now. So, typically, a save point, if you think back, save points are going to be at these, like, static locations that are away from entities or dangerous situations. And what that does is it allows us to load the game without worrying about entity storage, right? 
Because if we saved a game and there were entities on the screen, then we would have to probably save the location of those entities. But the reason, for example, if in Final Fantasy VI, they kind of do this thing where you walk in from one side of a room and then there's just a static room with nothing else in it except a save point. And then you walk out the other side of the map, right? So the reason they did this wasn't just an aesthetic choice. Like, I mean, this is beautiful. Right? What they've done here is created like, this is a special place. But on the same side, the programmers of the game, all they have to do now is save your stats. Right? They don't need to save the location of people because the only way you can save is if you're standing there. And so they don't need to save your position within the level. They don't need to save the position of any other NPCs that might be walking around because they've created this room specifically just for saving. Okay, so here's uh, the Final Fantasy VII save point, I believe. And over here we have another Final Fantasy game. Uh, does anyone know which Final Fantasy game this is? It's like 12 or 13 or something? I can't remember. Who knows what this is? This is a, a welcome sight if you've ever played these games. Oh, come on. Someone out there in the chat has to know what game this is. There you go. Bonfire and Dark Souls. Exactly. So the bonfires in, in Dark Souls or the Soulsborne games are the save points. And what happens when you click a, a bonfire and there are enemies around in a Dark Souls game? What happens? Does anyone, has anyone played them to know what happens? Exactly, they all reset. So whenever you go back to a level in Dark Souls, like if you exit the level and you come back, everything has respawned. But now, there's two things going on there as well. There's always the design decision and there's the implementation decision, right? So the design decision there with the uh, save point is that we want these save points to be sort of like a like a beacon for the player, so they know they're safe, right? So for example, if, you, if, if you're running to a bonfire and there's 10 enemies chasing you and they're, they're like, hammer is in the air about to hit you and you hit the bonfire, you're safe. And when you come back, that hammer is not there anymore. All the enemies have reset. Just imagine if they had taken the design decision to say, when you save, all the enemies just come back where they were, right? So you could enter these death loops and stuff and it would be terrible. But, so what they've done is whenever you go back, it's all reset. And so there's this really interesting choice that it gives you as the player, because now, for example, let's say that I've cleared 75% of a level and I've just got a little bit to go before a boss, but I'm low on health, I don't have any Estus left. Do I want to go back to the bonfire and and get all my health back? Or do I want to keep going? Because if I go back to the bonfire, this is actually a negative for me in a way because now all the enemies respawn, right? So how you choose to implement these save points is really interesting from a game design perspective as well. So just these bonfires, sometimes when you're running away from enemies, they're like just really good because they're gonna reset the enemies. But if you've already killed the enemies, and you want to go to the bonfire, now you have a decision to make. Do you want everything to respawn? Um, do you think that's a good trade, etc.? Similarly, uh, here we have Castlevania and we have Super Metroid. And in these games as well, there's always a room where you save, right? So you walk in here, you shoot the door open in Super Metroid, uh, Samus stands in the save point and you save the game. Similarly, in Castlevania, you have the really cool coffin animation that comes in. So you've prettied it up a little bit, but you've done the exact same thing that you did back in like Final Fantasy VI, which is you ensure that when you come in here to save, there's no other entities in that room so that you don't have to worry about entity storage um, when you're going to these games. Now, the other thing is that if you do this, uh, maybe, for example, when you go to save your game, you have to now have to choose sort of like Dark Souls, am I going to choose to reset everything? 
or am I going to choose to not reset everything, right? So if I came out of this room over here in Super Metroid and I come to save the game, when I go back into that room, everything has respawned again, right? I'm not sure what happens in Castlevania, but in a lot of these games, whenever you go back to an area, everything has respawned. Okay. Checkpoints. So unlike saved points, you can have level-based or sorry, level-based games may want a progress checkpoint placed within the level, or many checkpoints placed within the level. This reduces frustration by letting players save progress mid-level, but it doesn't allow players to make games easier or reduce RNG like quick save, okay? So for example, here in Super Mario World, we have these little gates, and when you walk through the gate, if you die after that point, you'll come back to the gate. Similarly, in uh, Sonic the Hedgehog, you have these checkpoints as well um, that you can walk through, and if you die, you go back to the checkpoint. So those checkpoints are, are placed in strategic locations by the game designers where sort of there's a break in the action, right? And then maybe there's no enemies around. Also, uh, anyone played this game before? Anyone know what this game is? So this is Shovel Knight, and we've got similar mechanics in Shovel Knight as well, okay? Okay, so checkpoint implementation. Checkpoints are pretty easy to implement. If a level has a finite number of checkpoints, you can just store the checkpoint number along with the level. And when the player enters a level, you just spawn them at the position of the checkpoint stored. Super, super simple. Um, and you reset the checkpoints when you reach the end of the level. That's it. Done. So what data do we save? Okay, now that we've talked about saving, what do we actually want to save? Well, this depends on... It's a game design decision first, right? It's... Like, like I said before, um, you may want to save the enemies that you've killed. Maybe you want to save your level progress in a game. Maybe you want to save your experience or the... Um, the weapons you've gathered or something like that, or the ammo, right? You have to choose what it is you want to save. So here's some examples. If you have, if you just want to save after a level, like maybe Super Mario Brothers, then you just store the current number of levels completed, maybe the inventory, maybe some weapons, right? If you want to save at a save point, maybe you have to talk about the quests you've completed, completed the party stats, the experienced, and you have to say where you sa which save point you use in order to save the game. If you're talking about a quick save, then what you might have to do is store the entire state of the game somehow, right? So you might have to just write all the entity data out because if you're like if you're running and jumping and there's three bullets coming at your face and you hit quick save, when you play the level out and then you hit quick load, you've got to go back to that state where all the bullets were about to hit your face. And so you might have to actually take your your entity manager and somehow write all that data out to a file and then when you quick load you read the file and you get all the data back in okay similarly you may have to store each of the entities components and so quick save and quick load is probably going to be the most amount of work when it comes to saving and loading even though it's kind of the most intuitive right because intuitively you save and then you go back to wherever you were then how do we load it so how to implement loading a saved game depends on which data you stored. So if the levels and items are stored, just recreate the game before that level starts, right? So for example, if I'm playing Super Mario Brothers 3 and I've got an inventory of items like some flutes or some stars or something like that, and I was on like World 3 and I've completed three levels, the first three levels, well, when I start the game, I'm going to be on World 3-4 and I'm going to have my inventory but I'm not within a level, so I don't need to worry about loading entities or stuff like that. I just appear on the overworld map with all of that stuff already completed. If it's a quick save, oh geez, well then I may have to go through all the entities that I wrote out to the file or to RAM or whatever, so that the game resumes from the exact spot where we quick saved. Okay, and someone said, ironically, that would make quick loading and quick saving slower, exactly because it would be more work to write out and then read in all of those entities. So here's an example of loading from an overworld view. So if we have this sort of overworld map, then saved games are going to store the levels completed 
and the current Mario status or inventory, like in Super Mario Bros. 3. When the game is loaded, Mario appears on the overworld map with the completed maps shown and the inventory available, right? And so this game load maybe requires you quitting to the main menu, or maybe it, it doesn't, okay? So that's depending on you and the game designer. Maybe a quick save is different. In Half-Life or other first-person shooters names, you can press a button at any time in order to instantly save. And when a quick load happens, all the entities and the game progress resume from when the button was pushed. So players, you know, whether or not you want to do that is up to you, but players are definitely going to abuse it to make the game a little um, more difficult or a little easier on themselves. Okie doke. The last method that I'm going to be talking about is called password save. And so in password save, um, what happens is you can't really write out to a file necessarily in some games. So some old games that didn't have, oh wow, look at this. It looks like there's a sniper. This is coming in through my blinds, the sunlight hitting me right in the forehead. That's hilarious. Um, so in password save, what you do is you're going to take all of your different variables that you have that you want to talk about saving and you're going to hash them somehow. So we talked about hash functions before, right? And we talked about XOR, we talked about all those operations. And so what's gonna happen is you're gonna hash those into an integer, and then you're gonna convert that integer into a password somehow. So for example, here's Mike Tyson's punch out. You're gonna put in a pass key. It's gonna take you to the level with your wins and losses. Over here in Mega Man, you're gonna put in these dots and that'll take you to the part where you've gotten to. So what I'm going to do now, I have I have some time left. I'm going to um, show a YouTube video from the YouTuber Biscuit, who has an excellent channel, and I highly recommend um, their content. Okay, and I'm going to play that here now. And he has a bit of a strong accent, so I apologize uh, for that, but you should still be able to understand him no problem. Uh, here is the link to the YouTube video, but I've also, um, I've also got it just embedded here in the PowerPoint. So I'm going to play this now, and it explains how the NES punch-out game stored its passwords. And he has an entire series of about 20 different videos where he goes through different NES games and decodes how the password system worked. So let me uh, take a second here to get that set up. I've got to turn on my desktop audio and I'm going to mute my microphone and I'm going to take away my camera. And this is about a seven minute video. I'll try to watch out for the sniper. Thank you for reminding me in the chat. And uh, I'm going to come back after the video. So don't leave before the video is over. Okay. All right, here we go. Many old games used paper and passwords to save and load the game. I am Biscuit, and in this series we crack video game password generators. Punch Out Bang Bang is a boxing game. It was originally sold as Mike Tyson's Punch Out Bang Bang. When the contract between Nintendo and Mike Tyson ended, Nintendo re-released the game as simply Punch-Out Bang Bang, and replaced the last opponent, Mike Tyson, with a generic Mr. Dream. Anyway, this game has 10-digit passwords. They are visually grouped like phone numbers to make them easier to remember. All that is saved in the password is seen on this screen. The win count, the loss count, the number of KO wins, and the game progress. Where you are currently competing, Major Circuit, World Circuit, or the World Circuit title bout. There are no passwords for the Minor Circuit. This makes the number of possible passwords 90,000. However, there are limitations. The number of wins by KO cannot be larger than the number of wins. This makes the number of passwords about half of that. Except, there's a bug in the game that makes the number slightly larger. We will explore the bug later in this video. In reality, the number is even larger. First things first, the password is made of base 10 digits. Computers deal with numbers. One would assume that 0 means 0, 1 means 1, and so on, right? Wrong. The meaning of the digits depends on the position. I'm sure this table looks very confusing, so let's take a look at the code. Everything becomes clear when we see source code. That's why I am so much a fan of free and open source software. Whenever there's something weird in how software behaves, 
take a look at the source code and ah, everything becomes clear. So is the case here. I am not sure why these two pieces are so different, even though they do pretty much the same thing. Let's look at the encoder since it's shorter. What happens here is that for each of the 10 positions in the password, a value is taken from the table at that position and added to the digit found in the password. If the result is 10 or greater, 10 is subtracted to keep the value in 0 to 9 range. The decoding is exactly the same, except that instead of adding, it subtracts. Here is the same code translated to some language. For each digit in the password, the digit is added or subtracted when encoding or decoding, and the result is wrapped to the 0 to 9 range. At this point, the game expects that each digit in the password is in 0 to 7 range. They may not necessarily be, but it expects that they are. All the following algorithms assume that the digits are 3 bit. Only the first 8 digits fit in 3 bytes. Numbers 8 and 9 do not fit in 3 bits, because their binary representation contains 4 or more digits. The numbers shown in this table are mathematics, nothing specific to this game. So, at this point, the game treats the password as 10 units of 3-bit values. The low 2 bits in the last unit, unit number 9, are read and interpreted as a rotation count. All the other bits in the rest of the password are rotated by this number of positions. When decoding, they are rotated in the manner shown in this chart. When encoding, they are rotated exactly the same, except in the opposite direction. After the rotation, the next step is that the game merges each pair of 3-bit units into 6-bit units. This merging is done with simple shift and or operations. Now, to study the meanings of each bit in the password, it may be necessary to give each bit a name. Let's use Latin letters. This way it becomes easier to track which bit goes where. Here is the map. The game extracts the wins, the losses, the knockouts and various other data by taking groups of two bits here and there and merging them into bigger integers. All bits are used for something, there are no unused bits. Technically one could skip the part where 3-bit units were merged into 6-bit units, but if you want to accept and deny exactly the same passwords as the game does with all its quirks, you must repeat the same steps. In any case, here is all the data that was extracted from the password. The game does pretty extensive checks to make sure the data is valid, however one of those checks has a little bug in it. This bug makes it possible to have more wins by KO than there are wins total, if the number of total wins is less than 10. Once again, all becomes clear when you look at the code. Here is a program that I wrote in JavaScript. It prints the list of all passwords that can be decoded by punch out bang bang. Now here is a question for you. Earlier we noticed that there are no unused bits in the password. Everything is perfectly accounted for and perfectly deterministic. Even the encryption, I mean the rotation, is directly derived from the number of losses and the game progress. So how is it possible that for every valid game state that you can extract, there are by average 17 different passwords that extract to the same game state? Write in the comments if you can figure it out. Here is a hint, watch the Bubble Bubble video. This program does not list these 6 passwords. These are hard-coded passwords in punch out bang bang These passwords are otherwise invalid, but the game contains hard-coded exceptions to deal with these passwords. The first three passwords are actually phone numbers of Nintendo headquarters in Japan and USA. Entering one of these numbers will make the game beep like a phone giving a busy signal. The other three take you into various situations in the game. I also wrote a C++ version of the password generator. The source code can be found in GitHub, the link is in the video description. JavaScript is not a bad programming language at all, but why don't I use it for all my programming? Try running both programs and you will see why. I am Biscuit, I hate trademarks and product names that incorporate exclamation marks. Stay tuned for the next time when we cover a game with passwords so variable that it takes an entire episode to describe how variable they are. Cool, all right, so that's Bisquit, and that is the end of the presentation. Um, so, 
Oh yeah, here's the, here's here's this again. So just remember that if I can bring this up again. All right. So we just did the game tools and drag and drop lecture, and I'll be uploading the um, the YouTube video soon. But you do need to implement a level editor and game saving and loading for your project. Okay. So this is sort of the lecture for that, and. You should get started on that probably at the beginning rather than saving that for the end because there may be some, some tricky parts to that. So that's it for this lecture. Remember that uh, assignment three is due on Tuesday. So if you haven't started that, you're probably in for a world of trouble because you had three weeks to do that. And on Tuesday, we are going to go through assignment four, and assignment four should be equally as fun as assignment three. So see you on Tuesday.